right, I mean, I'm good to get started if you guys are all ready. Sound good? All right, lovely. So um, thank you all for joining us here tonight. Um, before we begin, I, or we just want to acknowledge that we, along with our speakers and many of our attendees, are speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the Lenny Lenape people, whose presence and resilience in Pennsylvania continues to this day. We wanted to take this opportunity to honor the original caretakers of this land and recognize the histories of land theft, erasure, and oppression that have brought our institution and ourselves here. With that being said, thank you all so much for joining us. Today, we will be discussing creativity, community, and career with Leeway Foundation um, administrator and artist, respectively, uh, Rachel Moten and Maria Dumlau. Before we begin our discussion, Amelia and I will give a bit of background on both the Youth Council and the Leeway Foundation for those who may be unfamiliar. Um, just to start off with the Youth Council, PATHA's Youth Council is a free after-school program that offers interested teens a chance to learn more about the arts and culture sector. We curate exhibitions, hold events like these, and explore the exciting art scene of Philadelphia. Past projects of the Youth Council have included Multitudes, Whitman at 200, an exhibition honoring the bicentennial of Walt Whitman's death, At One Stroke, Prints by Helen Frankenthaler, a celebration of the aforementioned abstract expressionist, and various events surrounding these exhibitions. We've spoken at the Pennsylvania Museums Conference and the University of Pennsylvania's Arthur Ross Fine Arts Library. To any high schoolers in the audience who are interested in learning more about art and culture, and if you're here, I would wager that you are, then I would highly, highly suggest checking out Youth Council. While it is unfortunately my last year participating, I know there are so, so many fun and exciting projects planned for next year, and so many great and rich opportunities for a young person interested in the arts. Um, thank you, Jack. Uh, now I'll be talking about Leeway Foundation, um, because that this year the Youth Council has been working with both the Leeway Foundation and the Linda Lee Alter Collection. Um, the Linda Lee Alter, or the Leeway Foundation is an organization focused on supporting women and trans artists through their grants and other programs. It was founded in 1993 by Linda Lee Alter, an art collector and philanthropist in Philadelphia. Alter is also known for unprecedented and generous donation of over 500 artworks by women artists to PATHA in 2010. The collection began in the 1980s when Alter became more cognizant of the underrepresentation of women as artists. Both the Leeway Foundation and the Linda Lee Alter Collection are committed to diversity and inclusion when it comes to the cross pollination of art, culture, and social impact. Now we will be hearing from two artists that have been directly impacted by the Lua Foundation, whether as staff or grant recipients. We will also be having the time at the end of this webinar for everyone in the audience to ask questions for our panelists. As they present, we encourage you to leave questions in the Q&A in the Q&A tool below. Um, it's a function separate from the actual chat itself and allows us to moderate your questions at the end. Um, I'll now be giving a quick a uh, bio introduction for Rachel Moten. Um, she is a writer, director, and lover of memes. Her obsession with weird indie films and reality television led her to attend Temple University, where she graduated with a BFA in film with a concentration in directing. Her work has been supported by various organizations, including Sundance Institution, SF Film, the Westridge Foundation, TIFF, and the Gotham. As a storyteller, Rachel is passionate about sharing stories of marginalized people with the goal of promoting empathy, usually by, usually by utilizing comedy. In addition to filmmaking, she's a coordinator at Leeway Foundation and teaches youth, count, youth, films, youth film courses at Moore College of Art and Design. If she wasn't a filmmaker, Rachel believes that she would have been a great reality TV star. Um, and now she will be presenting. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm gonna load up um, a PowerPoint right now that shares more about me. And can you all see my screen? Okay, so a brief introduction to me. This is a picture of me holding my dog, Maui. But um, I was born and raised in Philly and I went to school at Temple University where I got a degree in film and media arts. 
And I also did a concentration specifically in directing. And I'm currently the residency coordinator at the Lee Wave Foundation. Um, and I wanted to do a brief shameless plug of our residencies. So we have one public program that's a residency, which is the Media Artist and Activist Residency. And grants of $25,000 are given to media artists working with social justice or cultural organizations that are documenting, reframing, or amplifying issues or campaigns addressed by the organization. $15,000 would be awarded to the artist, and then $10,000 goes directly to the organization. Um, and then we also have two programs that are for previous leeway grantees. We have the NextFab Art and Technology Residency. An artist receive a $2,500 stipend to cover supplies, the cost of classes from NextFab, and also receive the support from NextFab staff. And we also have an additional similar one, which is the Fleischer Visual Artist Residency, where you also would receive a $2,500 stipend to cover supplies and classes, and also receive support from Fleischer staff. And if you're interested in any of these programs, you can reach out to me at rmoten at leeway.org. So I wanted to kind of give like some background just on me as an artist and like the projects that I've completed. And one of my first projects was my thesis film that I did at Temple. This was a music video for a song called Piece of What. And honestly, I was just like inspired to kind of rebel against what traditionally is asked of a thesis project at film school. A lot of like my classmates did like either documentaries or narrative pieces. And I just was at a point where I like didn't really know what I wanted to make, but I knew I wanted to just make something that was like um, connected to black culture and also just like was fun and bright and colorful and just something that like I felt passionate about. So I'm gonna share that very quickly and hopefully it looks good on your screens, but let's see. If it's choppy or anything, please let me know in the chat. And if it doesn't work, I can just send a link out.
Yeah, so that was the first project that I made and I wasn't super excited about it, but um, it was just really nice to just have people like identify with it and care about it after it was finished. And since um, I created it, I've gotten a lot of people like just tell me that they really enjoyed it. And it was just exciting to hear because um, as you'll see, when I talk about my work, I don't really get super excited about sharing it because I get really anxious, but it was really exciting to me. Um, so after college, I just honestly was super broke and I knew I wanted to make a film, but didn't really have the money to do so. And I ended up partnering with a friend at the time who had shared with me that she had lost her dad in a tragic accident. And after he had passed away, she just really wanted to eat mayonnaise sandwiches because that was something that they enjoyed together. So I ended up making a short called Dad's Dead Damn It on a budget of like $2,000. We just charged everything to credit cards and we ended up making a short about a woman who loses her father and all she wants to do is eat mayonnaise sandwiches. And after we finished this film, I just like didn't feel super confident in it. And like, I'm, I'll be honest, I cried when it was finished. I was just like, oh, this is never gonna go anywhere. No one's gonna like it. And it ended up getting into a Sundance fellowship. And it was like the first project that I created that got um, kind of like widespread recognition. And it was really cool because after that, it kind of opened up a ton of other doors where I was able to make more projects. Um, and after that, I collaborated with the same artist and we made another film together, another short. And this one we actually had money for, so you can kind of tell in the stills that the budget was a little bit higher. But we collaborated on a short called Mary Mary Quite Contrary. And this is now available to stream on no, um, nobudge.com. But it's a film about a woman who's trying to lose her virginity because aliens are coming to earth to seek out virgins to take home with them to their planet. And it really just was inspired by like the concept of having agency over your body. And it's just playful and silly because that's the kind of films that I like to make. And then right now I'm working on my first feature film. It's a dark comedy called Paper Trail. And I've included the log line here, but I'll share it really quickly. And rapidly gentrifying North Philadelphia, two genius black siblings at risk of eviction begin doing the course, coursework of local college students in exchange for cash. When one of their clients, a white woman, goes viral from an essay they wrote, the siblings are faced with a moral dilemma. Allow their client to publicly use their voices or be, uh, or be caught at the center of a cheating scandal. And this film is essentially just about gentrification and performative activism in North Philly. And right now we're in pre-production on it. And then finally, I just shared two stills from um, some branded content that I make. This is kind of what I do to like pay the bills and also stay creative. But this is um, two scenes from a project I did for Megan Thee Stallion a couple years ago. Um, her album Good News had dropped and she really wanted to make um, like shorts that kind of like focus on black people, but in horror films, but sharing good news instead of like something scary. So these are two images from um, a short that we did that was inspired by the ring. So there's this point where like a creepy girl comes out of like a television screen and hands out envelopes that say good news on it, announcing her album. And it was really cool to make this. It was one of the first times I worked with like, kind of like a wide known artist. So just a really cool experience and just something fun that I feel like it was amazing to be a part of. But yeah, that's kind of um, a brief introduction to me as an artist and what I do. And Sorry, I'm trying to stop screen sharing, but I don't understand my screen. But yeah, that's kind of a background on me and like who I am as an artist. Right, well, thank you so much, Rachel. I think I can speak for all of us when I say that your work is so, so cool. Oh my God, like I don't need to <laughs> fangirl or anything. I just- Oh, thank you. There, there's so much to talk about here and this event would go for two more hours if I could say everything I wanted to say, but- um, <laughs> So sweet. <laughs> um, I want to move on to introducing um, the other artists we're showcasing tonight, Maria Domlau. Um, now, Maria works with combined media, including film, video, animation, sound, photography, embroidery, and installation. Her work combines images of history, popular culture, mythic folklore, landscapes, and creatures to propose alternatives to the systemic representations ordered by colonial narratives. Born in the Philippines, Maria immigrated to the U.S. mainland, where she currently lives and works in the traditional territory of the Lani Lenape. Most recently, she completed a commissioned installation for the Auckland Museum and Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center in Otoroa, New Zealand, and was awarded the Center for Emerging Visual Artists Fellowship and the Leeway Transformation Award. 
Um, now Maria will be showcasing some of her work for us. Hi, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Thanks so much, uh, PAFA Youth Council, and uh, especially Amelia and Jack, good job. Thank you for having me. And Rachel, thank you for sharing your work. I really enjoy your work and I can't wait to see Paper Trail. So keep working on it. <laughs> so let me share my screen. Um, I'm gonna be switching from uh, at, at some point here. Okay, so um, just to give you a context of my work, this is how it looks like uh, one way that it's installed. It's, uh, this is with a print and uh, domesticated plants. And this installation was at Moore College of Art uh, during the Leeway uh, 25th anniversary, I believe. And I was invited to participate, which was really an honor. Um, and uh, so this installation is one way you would see the work and I have the mosquito necks with um, uh, embroidery of creatures in it. Uh oh, hold on. Okay, that's how it works. So this one is an Asian arts initiative and I made this site specific work. Um, I was invited for the, also the anniversary of Asian arts initiative and uh, Site specific is um, what it what it means is that if it's uh, it's seen in a context of it's made for um, the piece is made in context for a specific time and place. So I made this for Asian Arts Initiative, and I I thought about why it's still necessary to have a place like Asian Arts Initiative. So I looked back at the history of uh, uh, what happened when Asian Arts started. So I was wondering. Well, what was happening in Philly, what was happening um, in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and then, and it got bigger, the research got bigger and bigger, and I thought about what was happening in Pennsylvania and in the global south. So the piece became Pacific 1993, which is a series of events that was happening in the Pacific that also ties back to immig immigration policy that we, um, are dealing with at the moment. So it ties back to the present. So that's the installation. Um, okay, I guess I'm scrolling. And this is outside of Crane Arts building uh, in 2021, last year. Um, and uh, this was a project that was um, initiated by Lori and uh, through the Philadelphia Photo Arts Center, which is now Tilt. Uh, this is uh, during the time when we still couldn't go into, it wasn't safe to be indoors. So, um, so they did this outdoor exhibition through the windows. And this is one of the, the pieces that was in the show amongst uh, three other artists. Um, and there's a, it's an interactive piece, which I will be talking about. Um, and there's a retractable cord that has these red, green, and blue filters that you can pull from the wall and uh, look at the image. And as you change the filters, the image changes, or you can see different details from the images. This is a still from um, the exhibition at um, Auckland uh, Museum and uh, Smithsonian um, collaboration, I did this in a silo and it became a backdrop for um, performance by this artist, uh, Samoan artist that talked about the Maoris and the, uh, the British taking over the, the, the islands. So the, the exhibition again was site specific. It was um, celebrating or the, the country was celebrating the landing of the first uh, Europeans in New Zealand. Um, so the whole country was celebrating that, but a group of um, the Auckland Museum and Smithsonian decided to celebrate it differently and invited uh, Pacific Islanders and Maoris and uh, indigenous populations from the Pacific Islands that were um, affected by uh, Captain Cook's arrival. Um, so this became 
a, a performance and we activated this silo um, in a public space. This is currently up at uh, Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education and I collaborated with uh, two artists um, to create this structure, which is also interactive. So there's filters in this structure and it looks over to the um, print. And here's another structure. And I will talk further about that later on. So my work is interactive um, where you can look at the image and uh, see the print itself, but you can also pick up these filters and interact with the filters. So the, the audience has the agency to explore the images and uh, change the narrative or see different narratives that exist within a print. So an example of that, so this is the same image that you saw that was installed outside of Crane Arts building. So this image on the top, this is a composite. So the image on the top is how you see the image in natural light, like without anything in front of it. And then the bottom has um, a composite of the green filter without filter and then with the red filter. And I have another illustration of that so you can see it better. So this is how it looks like um, by itself. And then with the green filter, this is what you see. And then with a red filter, um, you see the, the Lapu Lapu. Um, he's an, uh, was an indigenous uh, uh, Southern Filipino that killed Magellan. Magellan was this Portuguese um, explorer through this, the Spanish um, fleet. And they were for the first, uh, or they were the uh, explorers who discovered the Philippines, supposedly, that's in quote. Um, so he was killed by Lapu-Lapu. So the image itself um, has multiple narratives. So uh, the, the photograph in the back in green is actually a jungle uh, contemporary photograph. So I wanted to tie uh, a contemporary image with a historical image because it is in the same land, but multiple narratives exist within one plane. So, um, you know, you can, you can tie back um, now to the past, even within a space, and there's different narratives that are told to you. So if you go to a space, there's actually other narratives that exist in, within that space. I was... Uh, well, I'm going off tangent right now, but I was just listening to, um, or I was listening to Jessica Hernandez, an indig indigenous scientist, and she was talking about how every land is an indigenous land. Um, and it's just, um, and, and she talked about how we have to, that we, we need to relate more to the land. Um, so it just made me think of that because I'm talking about the work that I'm doing and um, it's a, another way to think about where you go in different spaces. Um, this is a piece called uh, Native Children, Thomasites, and Mayon Volcano in Capre. So this is again a composite image of the um, of the print. So the zoom, the image in the bottom is a zoomed in composite in green and no and uh, no filter and then red filter. And I have another illustration of that, which is, this is the print without filters. And this is with the green filters. And the same image with the red filter. So, and then, sorry, I'm just going to change this setting. Hold on a second, sorry. It's, not playing the way I want it to play. Okay. All right. All right. We'll see. Not still not doing that. Okay. So this is again the image. And I'm just going to show you a video also of um, that illustrates this better 
while I talk over it. So this is a video that shows um, how one would interact with the prints. So this is like without any effects, it's just like a regular camera <laughs> in, in front of the front of the prints and then moving the filters and switching the filters. And this is what you would see. So, um, so just to give you a background, so I'm just gonna talk over this as we watch this. So my background is that I, you know, as, um, as Jack mentioned, I am from the Philippines. I immigrated here. I actually did not have an art um, background when I um, moved here or my family didn't grow up with, or I, I wasn't brought up with uh, art in my world. Um, and my family was very religious, uh, is still very religious. So um, I didn't really study art until I got to college, until I was, um, you know, 1819. Um, and it was in college that I, I started to, I took a, an art history class. So it's pretty much just like if I were to walk into PAFA um, at age 19, and then that was the first time I saw art. Um, and so there was a lot of um, undoing in my past about like what I understood to be. And um, uh, because of, of my education. So uh, talking about this print, um, these prints. Um, so a lot of uh, how I arrived at these work has a lot to do with my own personal history of uh, seeing things the way they are, but then they're, they're actually not the way they are. And there are actually multiple narratives that exist that I did not know about that I wanted to expose. And I wanted to show different perspectives and just changing the perspective. Um, so that's the, the general background of, of where I come from. So um, I will talk more about it through my slides. So I'm sharing, I'm switching, like I said, so I hope I'm not confusing you with this. So um, I'm gonna share the PDF again. So you can see the PDF now, right? Okay, so um, so the, you just saw these uh, in quick time. So this image is um, a wild boar attack by a boa constrictor. I'm just gonna look at the time. I don't know how much time I have. Okay, so boa constrictor. Um, and so you saw these uh, videos in video form. So I'm just gonna go through this because I feel like I'm behind already. So sorry about that. So I talked about that already. I'm going to skip that part. So, um, so like what I, what I was saying, I'm from the Philippines. My education is through um, the Spanish um, Catholic, Catholicism. <laughs> so I, I grew up with that faith. And then I also grew up um, with an education that came from the United States. So my, uh, the school system in the Philippines are structured by the United States as we were, uh, quote, unquote, uh, civilized by the um, Americans. Um, and then um, a lot of Americans don't know this, but this, you know, we think about the US as this like icon, uh, this, this, this image, but then in reality, the United States actually has, has power over um, lands beyond the, the iconic uh, symbol of the United States. There's all these lands all over the Pacific that's actually owned by the US and controlled by the US. So, um, so like uh, an, an example of this that I can think of is that if you um, think of a clothes that says it's made in the US, but then it's actually made in Mariana Islands, um, it could still be considered made in the US, but then it was made under uh, poor labor practices. Um, that's like, you know, you, you think that it's like third world um, uh, labor, but it's actually made, you know, it's considered made in the US. So that's how, like, that's how manipulative the system is that, that we don't know about. And that's how hidden our history is here in the US. So that's part of like what I think about, like with these hidden narrative. 
and I'm sorry, I'm skipping over this. So, um, so yeah, this image that I showed you before, this is the original image that I found. So this also encompasses my, the background of the, of US education system or our understanding of ourselves um, is that we were um, uh, taken over, like we were controlled by the, the Spaniards and then sold to the US and then the US uh, uh, educated or civilized the savages as they would say. So a lot of our education is based on our colonizers point of view. And uh, so that, and uh, as uh, you might know, colonization has very layered, um, layered history of just not knowing who we are. So we were fractured from our own history and we started to believe in a, 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 the whiteness belief system, which goes in so many ways. So that's an, an example of an ad that you still see today to this day in the Philippines, you would see ads like this. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I'm running out of time, but I just, um, I feel like could, would you like, Jack, would you like me to keep going with this or should we just do the questions? Take your time, finish whatever okay. you need to finish. <laughs> I have a lot more, <laughs> but um, so like I said, so I'm going back to uh, my education now. So uh, I was saying that, so I grew up in the Catholic system, Catholic value system, and then the Americanization of education system. Uh, English was um, our, our second language, but in order to mobilize yourself and to be professional, you have to speak in English. So that was, um, it became like the more professional and more uh, literal, the literate language and it, it advances your class. So, um, so I went, when we immigrated, um, I took art history class in the US and that's when I realized that um, what, I took an art history class and then I, I learned all these things about the power of image and how image can influence a whole culture, a whole, um, faith even. So an example I used the Hagia Sophia is a Hagia Sophia where it was actually constructed uh, by, uh, Con by uh, Constantine uh, as a Christian church. But then when the land was taken over, it became um, a different faith. Uh, it became Islamic and then it became a museum and then it became Islamic again. So something as sacred, a sacred space could even change its own history and it could change a group of people's uh, faith. You know, that's how much power, money uh, and image and uh, representation has that you can actually change a story of a sacred space. So that's one of the things that I realized and I learned in art history. I also um, realized how through, through taking photography and take, um, learning about uh, different art, it really got me to understand the world better that um, our understanding of the world is mediated through images. And that's how I got into uh, image making, got into art. And then that's when I also started to question that everything that I believe in uh, up to that point was actually constructed by images. And that's how I was so, excited and uh, influenced by art making. And that's how I got into it. Um, and then uh, more on art history, I also realized how um, I didn't see myself in art other than being an object or I, I didn't identify uh, with any of the subjects or any of the artists. So I, I didn't think that this was something that I could do. I was just very interested in it, but I was just like, you know, um, the only way that I see myself in the museum that I could possibly be in a museum is if I was like nude or, you know, objectified. <laughs> um, so this is how, when I studied art history at the time, this was what I saw um, where uh, European or white male artists are um, appropriating African art or appropriating another, the otherness, um, fetishizing and uh, looking at the otherness um, 
And yeah, so that was the other thing that also uh, made me question about like who has the power to, to create images or to, uh, to represent what, what stories we see. Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna fast forward. So I'm just going to, I could answer more questions, but I just don't wanna take up more time. So I just wanna uh, share this uh, project that I did. Uh, it's uh, currently at the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. And it's called Companions Mas Masarap Magkasama. So this is a collaboration I did with uh, Bahai 215 with Omar Buenaventura and Nikki Uy. And I, I started working with them because um, they're, uh, we're friends through Potluck. They're Filipino artists as well. And we're friends through Potluck and we often talk about food and how we miss home. Um, and we also think about like, we, we exchange recipes and, I re and we realize that recipes are actually storytelling, like sharing recipes and how we think about our memory. And that's one way we can keep um, keeping, a, we can keep our community together and keep, have a sense of belonging through these um, food and through gatherings. So the, Title Mas Masarap Magdasama is roughly translates to more delicious together because I was thinking about how um, healing and uh, cultural preservation uh, is really more, is really is better and more effective and more delicious when it's done with a community and not just through yourself. You know, so if you're like undoing certain things and you're trying to heal from certain generational, from generational trauma or any tra trauma, it is uh, so much more delicious, so much better for yourself for, to be doing this with a community. So we started to do this project and we talked about um, how we can um, connect back to our relationship to, from being uh, away from our ancestral land and then now being in this land in Philly, which is someone else's ancestral land um, and how we can connect back to the land and how we can incorporate what's here, what's local and how we can support each other um, as, as people and how we can move forward as people. Um, so this is uh, the kids, some of the people that was at the opening and this is one of the installation. And we did some food walks um, or, or rec identifying uh, both uh, native plants and um, invasive plants or what they would call invasive plants. So part of what we did is um, write recipes um, incorporating uh, invasive plants. Um, incorporating them in Filipino recipes. And we had some food <laughs> and some folk music. So I wanted to show that this, um, I wanted the, the art to be more of a community uh, in, beyond the interactive uh, part of just looking at the images. I wanted it to be a communal thing that you actually have people involved and experience it. Um, so that's part of what I wanna show here. And I think the main thing about um, making this art um, uh, be interactive and also have be social is to have um, people like my family who didn't uh, have art in our life uh, growing up uh, to be welcome in these spaces and feel comfortable and have their own stories. Uh, they, they can recognize what it is that they're looking at. Um, yeah, so this is our images from inside. And then um, I'm just going to show one piece from this uh, in particular. So these are the, the images, and I'm just going to explain some of it. I told you I have a lot of images. I can, I'm always bad at narrowing it down. I'm so sorry. But um, so, okay, so this is one story. So every image, every print has, has stories. So I, I, 
include a bunch of narratives in one print, right? So this one, for example, um, if you look at the print on the left, I don't have the red green representation yet, but I have the sketches on the right. So the original sketches before I make the prints. Um, so the print on the left is what you would see at the show, but the sketch the, on the right is a sketch I started out with before I arrived to the image on the left. So I incorporated cans of spam and pineapple because um, the story with pineapple is that it is, um, you find a lot of uh, pineapple in Pacific islands, although in certain islands, it was actually introduced. So it wasn't even native, but then it became a naturalized plant. So in Hawaii, for example, um, the, uh, the Americans took over, also acquired Hawaii because um, the Dole and Del Monte plantation wanted to acquire the lands because pineapples, they could do a monocultural farming in, in, pine, in with pineapples in Hawaii. So that was actually the story of why the US acquired Hawaii or that's one of them. There was an influential guy that owned uh, Del Monte. And then at the same time, spam is a very uh, famous food that is um, all over the world. And it was spread, it's big on places that there were American soldiers. Like wherever there was a lot of US occupation, that's where spam is big. So a lot of that is in um, Pacific islands. So the biggest consumers of spam are in Pacific islands to the point that it became part of the culinary experience. So again, that's like another story that I wanted to incorporate as something that became, uh, that was something that was definitely invasive, but then it became naturalized and then, um, you know, became something that, that became part of the, the culinary experience. So that's an example of multiple stories. So I'm gonna stop right now because I'm way overdue. So I wanna open for, <laughs> give it back to Jack and Amelia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria. That's, your work is so interesting and I would love to keep talking about all of this. I wish we had more time. Um, Amelia, do you wanna get started with questions? Oh yes, now we have some questions at Youth Council. Um, came up to ask. We're going to be asking each of you separately first. So we have three questions for Rachel and three questions for Maria. Um, and actually, no, Jack, I think you have the first question for Rachel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Rachel, I just want to start out by asking you, um, you know, how did you find your way to Leeway with your background primarily in film and artistic practice? And how do you find, uh, how does your artistic practice influence your work at Leeway? Yeah, sure. So um, actually, I was living in LA and I had moved back to Philly last year and I was looking for a job, but I'm really specific about working with organizations or institutions that align with things that I'm actually passionate about. And at the time, Li Wei had been looking for someone to run the um, Media Artists and Activists Residency, which focuses on media art. So it aligned directly with what I'm interested in, but also because Li Wei's mission is so specifically focused on like supporting women, trans and gender non-conforming artists. It's just felt like a perfect like marriage of two things that are super important to me. And I was just excited to apply and just am now excited to be a part of the staff. Um, and as far as influencing, are you asking, I'm sorry, was the question how does Leeway influence my art or vice versa? I mean, either way really. Yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like I'm super influenced every day by the artists at Leeway. Like, I learned so much from just reviewing applications and just talking to artists. I feel like the there's like an, an exchange every time like I sit down with like an app support and I'm just learning how other artists are creating art and like what's passionate and what matters to them. And I kind of like use that to like reflect on my own work and be just more investigative about like what like is my art like promoting social change? Like what am I doing with my work that's aligning with like what's important to me? So yeah, it's kind of like it goes both ways. That's really admirable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Amelia? Oh, okay. Um, so our last question for you is, how have you seen the Leeway Foundation impact the arts scene and community in Philadelphia? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say that 
like honestly it's kind of like every week someone talks to me who's like a leeway grantee and they'll say something where I'm just like wow like we're actually doing work that matters like there was um someone I spoke to a couple weeks ago who just mentioned that like a leeway grant had like empowered them to like live their dream and it was just so cool hearing that because I'm like wow like I'm doing something where like I'm empowering someone to do what they've always dreamed of doing so yeah I just like I kind of see it every day with when just like meeting with people that they're like being able to like just being given the tools to be able to like live out their dreams and create the art that matters so that's um it's really great. I, you know, I never would have imagined that a foundation as important and like far reaching as Leeway would have grown out of um, Lee's collection of art. And it's just, mm -hmm. I don't know, I think it's really inspiring to think that that's a new way of imagining how art acquisition can go. Um, we're going to move on to Maria now, and then we'll ask both of you some questions together at the end. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so Amelia, would you care to take it away? So first of all, um, Maria, how has the Leeway Foundation like directly impacted you in your work and um, your growth as an artist? Uh, yeah, Leeway's unusual foundation, first of all, it's like really special. Um, it's like really recognizes the strength of individual voices and it's the voices that's not traditionally funded also. Um, you know, like, I mean, what I mean by traditional, I was just talking about that in art history. It's like, you know, uh, it's not, it's beyond just a formal, um, you know, art history, but it's actually a lot more, a lot deeper. Um, and in the intentions are just so, I'm talking about the you know, general funding of other artists. Like I'm really in good company and I feel so honored to be part of it. Um, because the, if you look at the, the roster of of who has gotten funding and support from Leeway. It's such an amazing, amazing group of, of people. Um, so how it helped me personally is that um, financially, the financial support is, is major because art making is so expensive. Materials are expensive. Um, just having, paying yourself uh, as an artist is really important. Um, for, for so many reasons, because you're validating yourself as an artist, or you're validated, you're encouraged, you're supported. Um, uh, this uh, foundation is letting the artists know that this is what you're doing is important. So that is really, um, really encouraging, because um, it's, it's hard to, to say like, oh, who, you know, you're always doubting yourself as an artist. You're always saying like, why am I even making this? Like, who is this for? No one's gonna see this. So that in itself is like a really, a true struggle for an artist. And having leeway um, come support you and tell you, no, you're, you're doing an important thing, keep doing it. I think it's like so valuable for artists to hear. Um, and yeah, just being part of the community is um, so valuable. I could just keep going to the website and see like, oh, who's doing what? And so many amazing work uh, comes out of the Leeway support, that the projects that come out of it that are supported by Leeway. Um, yeah, and it's a, it's a huge leg up. So <laughs> really, that's, that's, it, it's impacted me tremendously. It's amazing to see the sort of sense of community that Leeway has been able to provide artists in the Philadelphia area. Um, you know, we were even able to get in contact with you because Lori, Lori herself has worked with Leeway. It's just, I love that there's a network of artists together here. Um, just to move on to the next question. Um, Maria, I know you touched on this a bit in your presentation, but how, how did you find your artistic style and voice and how has that changed over time, especially you know, in the past two years throughout the pandemic? Mm. So um, I think that um, style and artistic voice is a, is a, a constant thing. It's a work in progress. And um, I do feel that I'm still finding it. I'm still looking for it. Um, and that's something that um, artists should always um, keep, we keep exploring. Um, so I do have a style, I do have a voice or a style, um, however, whatever that means, but everyone has it. Um, it's just a matter of um, uh, 
nurturing it, um, look like recognizing it in yourself. Um, like, just like we all played when we were kids, um, when we were younger, um, a lot of conditioning we have after when we got older, it's like, you know, there's a lot of seriousness and there's a lot of undoing in that, that you have to do and recognize what was exciting to you in the first place. Like when you were, you know, look back and um, what excited you when you were a kid, um, what was fun. Um, and those sense of play are actually um, your own voice and your own style. You can actually really trace it back from those moments. Um, so yeah, so I feel like, um, I think it just changed over time because I, I think, um, I think, uh, you just have to make time for it to, to make sure that you play. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. I'm sorry. Like you're saying, how did I find my voice? I'm still trying to look for it. Like I said, it was like through the education. And I think I answered some of that when I was in, uh, in school. And when you, know, when you have like these aha moments, um, like, oh, that's what I thought it was. But then um, just knowing it is not enough, but then you, you try to keep looking and you keep like taking care of that aha moment. And you're like, okay, what was that? So you just keep going back to, to exploring it. No, I, I love that you're keeping it sort of fun and playful, even when you have to talk about more serious topics like, you know, colonization and neo-imperialism and all that. Um, and you did sort of preempt a question I was just about to ask, what advice would you give to a young artist who's struggling to find their voice? So thank you for that, you know, thinking on the same wavelength here. Um, I would like to add to that though. Um, I think that um, I, a, a device, uh, the advice I have is to to um, to keep connecting with your community. So whoever is in this um, organization here in the Youth Council, whoever you meet, keep in contact and keep talking. Um, I have uh, people I still talk to when I was in college or from various uh, trips, like you know that you meet and uh, not, you know, not that you have to keep everyone as friend. <laughs> um, it's not the quantity, it's really the quality of the connections and friendship you make. And uh, you just don't know, uh, you know, when you'll cross paths again. And they really, that's how, you know, I think Rachel would know more since she's making all these films. So it takes a lot of collaboration to actually make it work to make things happen. Yeah, thank you. So. Um... Now we just have a couple of questions for both of you guys. Um, Amelia, would you care to kick that off? Yeah, so we'd love to know, how do you find um, that supportive community, not just like for your peers and like people you're working with, but also just for um, the audience that's like viewing your work as well, that supports your artwork and growth? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? It kind of cut out for me. Mm -hmm. um, basically, just how do you find a supportive community to either surround yourself with or to also just support your artwork? Yeah, my answer is kind of outdated because I started just like joining groups on Facebook when I first like wanted to like get into art. But um, honestly, I just like look for people and just that I thought were cool and I would just like DM them and be like, do you want to work with me? And just like kind of started building my com community by just like reaching out to people. Um, I don't know if that's the best advice, but I think like just e expanding your borders by just like reaching out to new people is always a great idea. And of course, like you won't always find like the best people through that, but like I've made friends through other friends by just being like, oh, like I'm looking for a DP. Do you know anyone who's like, Cool that I should work with, but just, you know, kind of just like letting your network like find you. You know, I'm sort of, I'm probably dating myself here, but I don't think I even have a Facebook account, but. Um. <laughs> don't embarrass me. I'm not that old. <laughs> no, I mean, you were with Magna Stallion, so clearly something's working out here, you know. <laughs> um, I guess uh, just one last question we'd like to ask you guys before we open this up to community questions. Um, you know, what advice would you give a young person, um, especially someone from an underrepresented community who um, 
may not see themselves reflected on the gallery walls, like who is interested in pursuing arts. Is that for both of us? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I can go first since I'm off mute. Um, I think the best advice that I have is just make the stories that you wanna make. When I was in film school, I felt like there was this pressure to like not make comedy films. Like everybody wanted me to like make like black trauma stories. And I feel like with marginalized people, there's like this push for everything we make to be super serious or like to just like be like this like huge cultural moment. And I think that like marginalized people are allowed to make whatever we wanna make. Like you don't have to just make something because there's this pressure to like, you know, like fit into this box of like what an artist can be. So I think as long as you're like making the art that like matters to you, you'll be fine. Uh, Maria, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think um, yeah, what Rachel said, and also to just keep um, stay curious um, and don't stop learning. Like whether that's like skills or learning about anything, really learning about especially your history, your family. Talk to your um, talk to your grandparents. Ask them what their stories are, um, because you know that's part of you. Whatever uh, stories you're grandparents have wherever they live or however they lived, that is a big part of your story as well. Um, you might not know it exactly, but to, to hear them tell you, um, it, a lot of things will make sense to you, why you are who you are uh, and what makes you. Um, so wherever you go, they are always gonna be part of you in some ways. Um, and whether or not you have a background that's like a loving background or not, uh, try to figure that out because there's a lot that you can get out of it, whether it's good or bad. Um, you know, it could be a source of strength. Uh, it could be a source of love. Um, and uh, yeah, be patient with yourself if, if uh, the art doesn't seem to come through right away. Um, you know, and don't, don't, judge yourself too hard and don't compare yourself. I think that's the most toxic thing that artists can do to themselves. Um, so just, just be patient. And I think that's, that's my main advice. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I love that. Um, so I, we don't have any um, audience questions right now and we're nearing the end of our presentation. So I just want to take this time to thank both Maria and Rachel for coming on and talking to us today. Um, I really enjoyed seeing both of your work and hearing your advice. It was very inspiring, um, especially as someone who's hoping to make it kind of as an artist myself. Um, sorry, Jack. Um. Well, yeah, thank you both so much for joining us today. It was really such a pleasure to meet you and talk to you both. And thank you to everyone in the audience who showed up today. Um, it's so great to see some supportive faces in the audience. Um, yeah, so unless there's anything else any of you want to add, I'm happy to uh, wrap this up. Sorry about that. I had a, like a mini emergency right there. Um, but yeah, just really a huge thank you to both of you and also for Jack for and Lori and Susanna. Yes, thank you. And um, this is my last year of youth council, unfortunately. So I just want to thank Susanna and Lori and everyone at PAFA for an incredible last four years. Um, thank you all so much. Oh, Jack, you're great. So are you, Amelia. We'll miss you. We'll miss you too. <laughs> all right, well, good night, everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>